Hi and welcome back to the inside of my head. In this video I'm looking at the weirdest and wildest looking Transformers and the strangest things they've turned into. I'm mainly going to look at the screen stuff, few comics, quick look at Rise of the Beasts, but I might look into an occasional toy or action figure as well. So if you're into Transformers, maybe you should consider subscribing. I don't know, I'm just saying. Just follow my orders, drone! <laughs> Let's kick off with a couple Fusors. So a Fusor is what happens when a quantum surge causes your stasis pod to malfunction, prompting the computer to choose two native life forms and smush them together, giving you some of the craziest alt modes the franchise has ever seen. Fans will probably be aware of Silverbolt and Quickstrike, but there are definitely a few of these that I hadn't heard of at least. Talker, for example, looks badass. His beast mode being a mix of orca whale and an elephant, which makes him both adept at fighting on land and on sea. There's also Noctoro, whose beast mode is a mixture of bat and bull. And although that looks a little bit weird, his bot mode does look really cool. Looks like something out of Doom. Air Hammer was, hmm, interesting, let's just say fusing a hawk and a hammerhead shark together. But the one that was just absolute madness was Injector, whose stasis pod chose a hornet and a lionfish. So yes, it's a strange combo, but it's just the way the fish is like eating his head, like his head is in the fish's mouth. It's just bonk, 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 bonkers. Oh, and on top of everything, back on Cybertron, his alt mode was a sleek fighter jet, so he must feel really screwed over. There's been a bit of artwork banded around for Rise of the Beasts. And is it weird that we haven't seen very much of that movie yet, apart from the trailers? Scourge looks pretty good, like okay, but pretty good. But I think the most interesting is Freezy. He's got this kind of spindly spider-like thing, that, which reminds me a lot of Bayformer's Frenzy. And if this is Battle Trap's official robot mode, I'm pretty happy. I think he looks pretty cool. So, rats. Not exactly my favorite animal anyway, although I do appreciate they're supposed to be really smart. And Beast Wars did manage to portray Rat Trap's alt mode as a fairly likable animal. Beast Machines, on the other hand. <laughs> You're kidding, right? And out of all the hideous concoctions they came up with for Beast Machines in the name of being techno-organic, like this chick ain't got no skin, this guy's face protrudes from his skull, this emo looking f***er shoots out its teeth on a string. Out of all of those, Rat Trap is the purest, the most highest percentage nightmare fuel you can buy on the shelves today. Rat Trap looks like a cyborg chimpanzee f***ed a Segway in some kind of David Cronenberg Clive Barker kink fantasy. His eyes just about point in the same direction, like he looks like he's got brain damage, his ribs are exposed. There's something about him that just screams lobotomy. Although I guess his brain always was exposed, wasn't it? That was always a little bit weird. But Rat Trap, what have they done to you? And listen up, Beast Machine fans, I do apologize if it seems like I'm just repeatedly beating on this show. This show probably does have other merits, I just find it really hard to get past those characters. Let us speak of the Treecons. Yeah, this is a doozy. Hey bro, what do you want as an alt mode? Combat vehicle, weaponized vehicle, just a super cool car vehicle, just a, some kind of weapon, any kind of weapon? Well, I like standing still a lot, providing shade, uh, providing fruit. Healthy snacks. Grand Architect, right? AKA Adaptus, who was like the inventor of transformation itself, started doing a series of experiments with Sentio Metallica, which is in brief, the metal that Cybertronians and Cybertron itself is made up of. It has a self-replicating cell structure and its own genetic code and is highly adaptable. So it's ideal when some mad nutty professor wants to come along and create some mad abomination. Oh, I love having guns pointed at me. Now, from my understanding, the Grand Architect took one of these, a creature made of wood and soft circuitry and fibrous tissue and tried to enhance its abilities or god knows what but his test subject this prototype died when the ship it was on these are called world sweepers by the way crashed on a planet in the coal system called clemency but years later the scavengers met a whole tribe of these things on a planet called confluence where grimlock ripped them to pieces <laughs> oh grimlock what i'm saying is that i don't know if the grand architect was the creator of this race or not it could be that he took just one specimen from planet confluence and did his evil deeds on it maybe he just watched lord of the rings he was like fuck Ents, man. Yeah. I love Whirl. And look at this guy. You can't help but love the way this guy doesn't really look humanized in the way the other bots do. Like his little clampy hands and his security camera for a head. And hold on one sec. Oh, really? Oh, amputation, you don't say. Um, right, okay. Let me just backpedal everything I've just said.
Do you know what's no laughing matter? Torture. torture. Unless you're talking about tickle torture, which technically is a laughing matter. And yeah, that's the reason that Whirl has such distinctive looks. Basically, according to IDW, he was subjected to Emperata, which involved amputating a subject's hands and replacing their heads with a generic characterless and individuality devoid husk. This is what he looked like before. Is it wrong to prefer how he looked after? Anyway, moving briskly on, quick mention goes to Megatron's Purple Sphinx, which didn't seem to be a Transformer like all the other Transformers was, like Astro Train was. There was never any indication that this was sentient, it just seemed to be a vehicle that I think was in the shape of a Sphinx because it was in an EP set in the Middle East. So MT thought, ah, it'll blend in just fine. Um, yeah, let's put it right next to that other Sphinx. Nobody will tell the difference. MT, you madman. Crazy. While we're talking flamboyance, quick mention goes to Rodimus's ship right here, the Rod Pod, which he's clearly gone to quite some trouble to make look like himself. So here we have a design that gives us a streamlined aerodynamic shape for in-atmosphere maneuverability, but it is robust enough to withstand pressures that are faster than light travel. What do you think, Bob? You know what I was just thinking about? Me. So let's do that, okay, bro. This guy knows how to establish his branding. I mean, it looks like a cross between Hot Rod and Night Owl from Watchmen. Does anyone else see that? Anyway, but at one point, this thing gets picked up and thrown to stop Sunder at one point. So yeah, it saves the day in more ways than one. It just looks cool. Robots in Disguise gave us some mad ones as well, notably Slapper, who transformed into this pink frog, and Gaskunk, who, well, it's what it sounds like. But they were led by Skybite, who was just mental. Now, I love Skybite because he was just absolutely bonkers. Bonk, 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 bonk. A flying and burrowing shark who was admittedly pretty smart and sensitive, writing his own poetry and haikus. But was prone to shitting the bed when things went south, and especially when Scourge threatened to replace him as Megatron's second in command. In the IDW continuity, he hooked up with Jazz and gave poetry recitals. Julia Roberts! Julia Rob Hurts! And I don't think I'll ever forget him swimming off into the sunset at the end of R.I.D. You're dead! Let's talk about Freud. So with a name like that, clearly a nod to the famous psychologist Freud, this guy will have you on a sofa so fast you won't even have time to whisper, no, not the straitjacket, before he's delving into your mind to find your weak points. He was the Senate's chief psychopathologist, happily dishing out personality adjustments to anyone thinking anti-authoritarian thoughts, and he was instrumental in the arrest of Sunder, or as he was otherwise known, the Terrahex Killer. Terrahex Ripper. Terrahex Killer? Terrahex Ripper. It does matter! I spoke about these two in my most horrific deeds of the Autobot, so make sure you look that one up. Anyway, Freud is a pretty different looking Transformer, don't you think? With this sort of breathing apparatus thing on his face and his kind of spindly long limbs. I don't know, he's different, but there's something that I really like about him. Plus this kind of chrome, you know, this kind of chrome paint job. Do you think they've done that on purpose? Like a conversation with this guy is actually like looking at yourself. That would be clever. Toys, let's do toys. <laughs> Optimus turned into a shoe once. Did you know that? Yeah, why? Why not? Of course, it was a promotional team up between Nike and Hasbro, and it shouldn't really be thought about much beyond that. And there are undoubtedly enough Transformers collectors and sneakerheads out there to make this desirable as undoubtedly one of the craziest things that Optimus has turned into. He also turned into a PlayStation at some point, apparently. Speaking of Transformers shoes, I had these! I had these, this is a real blast from the past for me. I'm also fairly sure that I have seen bots turned into... Um... How to phrase this on YouTube. Um, lady pleasurers? Let's put it that way. They called it the Gal Viberatron. Let me know if you want a video about weirdest Transformers merch, because there is a shit ton of it. Moving on, there's Scalpel. Also known as the Doctor, he has an enormous amount of knowledge stored in that big brain of his, which is... which... Which is where, exactly? I don't, I don't know. I guess hard drives are getting smaller and smaller. This is another example of Michael Bay's love of all things spindly and spidery. Like, and like all decent mad professors, he has a German accent. This guy loves a good dissection and a good experiment, but unfortunately isn't quite so good at putting his test subjects back together again. Crazy, but in a good way. I like this guy. I love that he needs glasses as well. Like Cybertronians can fix your personality and erase bits of your memory, but they can't fix short-sightedness. Whatever. I mentioned this in a previous vid, but why, oh why, did they make the most powerful Decepticon ever look like this? I don't know. For me, a large part of the problem was the resemblance with a franchise that I was never a big fan of. 
that being Lego's Bionicle. Again, Bionicle has its fans. That's cool. Unfortunately, I'm not one of them. So Megatronus, AKA the Fallen, AKA crazy letdown. And speaking of letdowns, we got to throw Quintessa and Bayverse Galvatron onto that particular bonfire too. Where the Bayverse didn't disappoint though was with the Driller. That was epic. <laughs> give it to me, give it to me. <laughs> Dragonstorm was pretty cool. Although someone's got to explain to me what happens here. Flying along happily, majestically. Coming to save the day. Oops, hit the ground. That was clumsy. <laughs> also, Infernicus, who was absolutely bold. <laughs> This is one you'd expect me to talk about because it's kind of one of the more obviously crazy designs. Is that Skylinks? <laughs> a goose dog space shuttle or did someone bolt wings onto a Diplodocus? I don't know, it just f uses me. He separates into these two parts. His head doesn't really transform at all. The bottom just hinges up and down so that he can talk. But I do love that they haven't made him a figure of ridicule. They've stuck to their guns and he's actually portrayed as really, really powerful. So they've really rolled with it. So you can see how he has become crazy beloved. One that blew my little socks off <laughs> was Demolisher's appearance in, in Revenge of the Fallen. When he first transformed and started scooting along on this big beefy unicycle, it was abundantly clear that this movie was going way more adventurous with its design. As we saw when an almost identical scavenger appeared later in the movie, Demolisher was far from unique. As the IDW comics explained, this body type was one of the first created by the Allspark, and they were tasked with the construction of the Star Harvesters. Then the Civil War broke out and he was used as a shock trooper to massacre settlements of Autobots. And it was around this time that he struck up a rivalry with Sideswipe, which they carried over to their days on Earth, where their battle left a trail of destruction through Uruguay and Argentina before Demolisher went to ground and went into hiding, before being hunted, tracked down, and murdered uh, by the Autobots. But, you know, let's, let's talk about that elsewhere. Crazy jaw-dropping design. Love it. I could devote a whole section of this video to the appliance parts from Revenge of the Fallen, but suffice to say, I didn't like any of these. Obviously, it was played for laughs. They were supposed to be these little gremlins type characters, but didn't have any of the charm of those. They're just kind of annoying. There's a coffee machine bot, a waste disposal bot. There's a Dyson bot. There's a toaster bot. Microwave bot looked pretty cool. But the craziest one was this blender bot who had this massive dick cannon that even sort of glows, this pulsating red and has this kind of spinny thing on the tip. What the fuck? You can't help but chuckle, I suppose. But also he has these facial features that make him look like he's from the very bottom of the Decepticon gene pool. Interestingly, there's a more kid-friendly book called Transformers When Robots Attack. And in that one, they took um, his, his dick and they made his arm instead. I guess to avoid any parents getting any awkward questions. Daddy, where has he got to go now? Well, Timmy, because the world's a filthy place! And if anyone's ever wondered, like, why are these things so aggressive? As soon as they get hit by the Allspark energy, they seem to turn into these crazy monsters. Like, why don't any of them turn into nice Autobots, you know? Well, just remember that a lot of modern day technology has been reverse engineered from Megatron. But as soon as they get hit by Allspark energy, they turn into these little bastards. Suffice to say that I was pretty satisfied when B nuked all of these. Vaporized them to death. As opposed to vaporized mildly hmm. so the hypersexualization of females in comics is nothing new and no matter how you feel about it it was only going to be a matter of time before they started putting jiggly bits on robots but beyond that i don't really want to dwell on this but as far as crazy designs go we've got to mention flame war especially with the way that certain fans have just gone all out with this now not to say that she's always portrayed like this and beyond the superficial, there's actually quite an interesting character here. In some continuity, she's one of the oldest Decepticons and one of the first to join the Decepticon cause. Let's talk about Alpha Q. So Energon put a fresh spin on the Quintessence, at least with this one guy called Alpha Q, whose design I love, especially the way he looks in the Energon comics. I think this guy has a lot of potential to be a fearsome villain, but that wasn't really fulfilled in the show as he was portrayed as more of a tragic sort of character. So in this continuity, Planet Q was attacked by Unicron and the planet's inhabitants came up with this plan to self-destruct the planet as it was being devoured and kill Unicron. The ruler chickened out though, but his second-in-command took charge, blew the planet and massively damaged Unicron, but didn't kill him. 
So the planet's ruler survived, but his solitary existence inside Unicron meant that his psyche fractured and gave him five distinct personalities, a couple of which were pretty funny. Such a small creature! Are you sure he's the one we've been waiting for? And long story short, he set about rebuilding his armies and restoring Planet Q to its former glory. He couldn't have done any of that without building this new body for himself though, this creepy form that's kind of Medusa-like in its body and tail, but then has these elongated arms. As far as Energon designs go, I really like it. He made this body from the bones of Unicron's devoured victims, and he has these claw-like tendrils as well, as well as what looks to be an impenetrable shell. Impenetrable at least to Energon swords, as this kid demonstrated by hitting it like 500 times in a row. So like I said, in the show, tragic bad guy. But in the comics, he was more of a straight up villain, where he gave the Terracons, led by Scorponok, these hyper modes and sent them to Earth to get its juicy energy on. He also sent Unicron's four horsemen, war, death, famine, and pestilence, who I'll get to in a later vid, maybe. Let's talk about Prime's version of Galvatron. Okay, there, you guys wanted me to talk about how this guy is Galvatron, and here it is, because this is one of my favorite bot designs in all of Transformers. So yes, after Megatron was upgraded by the spirit of Unicron, he got new weaponry, a new alt mode, and a new look, taking what was already a formidable fighting machine and just turning all the dials up to 11. He's never actually referred to by the name Galvatron, but it would stand to reason that the big G was represented in Prime somewhere. Anyway, look at this guy. But what I love more than his appearance is his demeanor. G1's Galvatron took the whole unhinged maniac thing pretty far. So this guy is colder, calmer, and more collected, as well as being uber powerful. So it was just crazy cool. But if you mention him, you've got to mention Prime Optimus. Now I have to admit, at first I wasn't crazy about OP's design initially, but it did quickly grow on me, and when he started getting beefed up further into the show, Sir, you're looking robust. Plus the sword, the jetpack, like, you know, he quickly became my favorite incarnation of Optimus which all contributed to his death at the end of Beast Hunters and the drawing to a close of this amazing era being all the more poignant. Crazy beefy, but also sniff. Notable mention has to go to Ripper Snapper, who has been voted the worst Transformers design in the past. He's supposed to be a shark with these little legs and these little arms, but he sort of stands there looking like a fetus in a sort of puppy begging pose. But all that said, to me, he was never as bad as Skybite, who we will come back to. Right, if you want to go full Frankenstein, <laughs> There was Autobot X from G1. That was the result of Sparkplug Witwicky experimenting to create a drone using a bunch of spare Autobot parts. This thing ended up with having Spike's mind uploaded into it after he was severely injured. And as you'd expect, waking up in this scrap heap shitbox kind of fried his mind a little bit and he went nuts before the Autobots managed to get him out of there and kind of conveniently forgot that the whole thing ever happened. Next, I want to talk about the Insecticon Swarm. In IDW's 2005 continuity, the Decepticons attempt to create, or clone, I'm not sure which, Insecticons, which resulted in a success rate of just one in a thousand, which, would, which meant that for every successful creation of an Insecticon, there were 1,000 failures, which were banished underground, where their role was to protect the core of Cybertron from threats. Now, these are essentially your standard zombie. As individuals, they're not that powerful, but their numbers meant that they could overrun almost any opponent, as we saw here, where all of the firepower of an arc couldn't stop them from getting in through the hull. And Ironhide only survived this by self-destructing this ship and then getting help from Metroplex, who squished them. Apparently, if you manage to separate one individual member from the pack, you could domesticate it, which is how the Autobots got Bob here. Bob! Let's talk about the transmutate protoform. A transmutate. Now, I've got to tread a little carefully with what I say about this one, because in this Beast Wars ep, where a stasis pod crash lands and reveals this protoform, there are some pretty delicate issues going on. Now, I don't really want to get into any great detail here, because knowing me, I'll inevitably blunder into saying something obtuse or offensive without even really meaning to. But just briefly, this ep deals with some pretty touchy issues like disability and even euthanasia. There's even a scene where the Maximals discuss whether everyone would be better off if they put her into a coma and just keep her there. It's a danger to itself and everyone around it. 
best thing for us all would be to put it in stasis lock immediately. Yeah, but detaching ourselves from all of that, this one makes the list because there's nothing else like this in Transformers, as far as I know at least, and regardless of how this episode has aged... Do you have a name, my twisted friend? Ooh. This is one example of Transformers not shying away from dealing with sensitive issues. And this whole thing is especially sad because she sacrifices herself to stop the Predacons and the Maximals killing each other. Now, many Transformers fans don't even want to acknowledge the fact that this one exists. Don't know what you're talking about, never happened. And I've spoken about the Dinobot Combiner known as The Beast in past videos. And for you guys who are asking why I didn't include this on my most powerful Combiners list, the reason is that there aren't many who actually take it seriously. It was meant to be a combination so powerful that Grimlock vowed never to unleash it again, and only did so because it was an absolute last resort. It went crazy, killing both Autobots and Decepticons, and it was unique in the fact that it wasn't just a simple combination. The Dinobots had to physically and horrifically break themselves down and then recombine into what was meant to be a monstrosity. And all that sounds fine, but it just wasn't drawn very well. The proportions are odd, the face is fucked up in the chin, oh, what? It simply is convincing precisely no one that it is this cataclysmic monstrosity that it's hyped up to be. So a couple of notable mentions, and as I said, I don't really want to talk about the Japanese stuff too much, but in the Japanese Beast Wars, there were some crackers. First up, Dead End, who turns into an Ammonite. Do I need to say more? Apparently his tentacles can emit bursts of electricity that shock his victims into unconsciousness. <laughs> like if you saw a giant snail coming towards you, would you really let it get close enough to wrap its tentacles around you? The Seekers from Revenge of the Fallen were pretty cool. There was an unnamed Model T and one called Ransack, which turned into this biplane. He even shot Starscream in the back at one point. And there was this guy called Fortress, who I think was another biplane. And as we're on the subject of classic vehicles, Scourge turned into a blimp once. I thought that looked pretty cool. But all that said, the one that I find the weirdest, the craziest, the most out of place in its own universe is Bunnybot Moon. <laughs> Now, I would normally skip the Japanese continuities just because I haven't really watched them properly, but because he was in Last Bot Standing, I figure it's fair game. But just briefly, in the Japanese Beast Wars, he was of Gaian origin that had invisibility power and could fly. Anyway, just in case you don't know, Last Bot Standing takes place long after the Cybertronians have run out of Energon. They're on the verge of extinction and hopping from planet to planet trying to find any sustenance they can. The remaining Autobots are hunted, and Moon is a scout on the trail of an old and kind of senile Rodimus because he's so starved Energon, Moon is a bot that reformatted itself to look like this as a statement. Although what that statement is, I literally have no idea. Especially as having an alt mode of a rabbit has the disadvantage that it makes him slower than all the cars and planes and motorbikes and shit. He used to be known as Spine Shucker, which is a pretty fearsome sounding name, right? Although I don't really know what a shucker is. And he talks like he's quite the disciplined soldier. At one point, he goes to eat this squishy Humi right here before befriending her and eventually giving his life to protect her from razor sharp bits of shrapnel and debris. Yeah, it's, it's all a bit confusing. He also had a cameo in IDW's 2005 continuity where he was a Maximal working under Onyx Prime and he battled RC and I mean, there you go, it's another cameo. Now this one is definitely a case of the Japanese just kind of doing their thing. But it was bringing it into Last Bot Standing and trying to pass it off as just any other Transformer that just didn't really work. And I came across at least one other rabbit in the comic somewhere as well as a penguin and a plesiosaur. But there's something about the way this one is anthropomorphized that just screams furry. All right, guys, let's leave that there. Let me know which you think are the weirdest designs. And I will see you very soon for the next one. Thank you very much for watching and cheerio. Bye. Bye.